The big deal with Pablo Picasso has to do with how quickly he could make big stylistic leaps. So we have him in 1903 in what is called his blue period. By 1905, he's made a switch to a rose period. In the blue period, he's using the expressive style, color, brushwork, non-naturalistic space that we associate with expressionism, with symbolism. He's showing a figure who is clearly barefoot, seated on the floor, some kind of marginal oppressed figure of poverty and deprivation, recalling the interests of realism. The body's forms have all sorts of exaggerations and distortions. They're angular, sharp, they're bony in a way that suggests death and deprivation. By the Rose period, the color tone has changed and the expressive quality of blue, which was associated with this kind of melancholy, this sense of deprivation, destitution, this kind of pink is somewhat different, a little more romantic. We get in the Rose period art about artists because the saltimbanks, the circus performers, are a version of an artist, a kind of metaphor for being an artist, someone who makes illusions, which is what Picasso does, or makes beauty or makes vivid, enticing visions. They're in a kind of an indeterminate space that has a little bit of a feeling of being lost in a, in a nowhere land. 1903, 1905, by 1907, he makes an even bigger leap with this very famous painting that he called my first exorcism painting. And it was a breakthrough. We're still seeing pink and blue as dominant color tones used for expressive purposes. Now we have forms that are arranged in this, this strange configuration of sharp facets that seem to cut the space. And so that the space, we're not clear what is solid and what is void. Is this a curtain? Is this blue? The space between forms? Is there something physically present there? The figure ground relationship is compressed and confusing. And the image is an exorcism painting that feels threatening and disturbing. It's widely used or described today as Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, French for the young ladies of Avignon. But, but Picasso referred to it as the philosophical brothel. So he was very blunt that this is a scene of prostitution. It's a brothel, a brothel. And so the nudes assembled here are understood to be prostitutes, sex workers, in this strange space of red and blue with their strange pink bodies. They are nude and quoting certain nude forms that are famous from the history of art. Angra, the French painter painting the Venus and the Diamond in 1848, an image of a kind of seductive nude where she lifts up her arm to show even more her body as available, as compliant, as a kind of um, sexual delectation for the eyes of the viewer. That is kind of parodied here, where the curtain is pulled back, the arms are lifted, but we don't get availability or compliance or sexual delectation. We get fierce stares back at us. We get a face that seems distorted, the eyes are uneven, what's going on with this nose? What's going on here? Is this a mask? Everything feels sharp and penetrating in the worst sense, like broken glass. The watermelon looks like a dagger. There's a sense of hostility in these forms, in the, that it's actually in the, the jaggedness of the forms. And what Picasso is doing is making this big stylistic leap because he's learning from 
African masks that he sees when he visits an ethnographic museum in Paris, and when he actually can buy some African sculptures from Paris art dealers and keep them in his studio, as you see in this photograph. He's also learning from Siberian, excuse me, not Siberian, Iberian sculpture that dates back to the 5th century BCE, thousands of years ago. And he's looking at their forms. He's fascinated by how powerful the non-naturalistic forms are. Partly this involves simplification, which he sees in the Iberian sculpture, where he sees this kind of strong, clear line of forehead to nose that he puts into his figures. But it will be more than that. He will see that it's also invention and conception, which is what he learns from the African masks, where they are not trying to create the look of things, but to use concepts inventively to create eyes that have a certain kind of focused power, a, a very sharp edged, jagged nose to create its, an expressive power and the mouth turned into a circle. This he applies to another one of his figures. So whereas he had once mixed up symbolism, some ideas from realism, some expressionist use of color, now he's actually mixing things up from other cultural traditions. So he is certainly using primitivism. He's thinking in terms of primitivism, which is a word used to talk about how artists of this time are looking at cultures that are very other to foreign to European culture and understanding them to be interesting in their difference. They're also looking at them through a kind of a racist, neo-colonialist lens because they're thinking that this is primitive. This is primitive. This is not primitive. This is sophisticated. This is actually very um, refined and belongs to a specific tradition. The sculptural tradition of the, ca the continent of Africa is widely understood to be the greatest sculptural tradition in the world, made up of many sub-traditions. So Picasso goes to the Ethnographic Museum and he describes this later. Now notice this letter is in 1937. So this is, you know, 30 years after he was supposed to have gone there. Um, so we can't be totally sure that he hasn't kind of clouded his memory, forgotten things, or remade it in his mind. But here's what he had to say in 37. When I went to the old museum, it was disgusting. So this intense emotion of disgust. I was all alone. I wanted to get away, but I didn't leave. So he's explaining, he's, he's talking about disgust and fear and yet something is compelling him to stay. I understood that it was all very important. The masks weren't just like any other pieces of sculpture, not at all. They're making him think about sculpture as an entirely different category. They were magic things. That they, he's seeing them as having magic powers, that they're not just to look at, to be looked at, to, to talk about how we look at the world, but actually to do something, to have a forcefulness. They were against everything, against unknown threatening spirits. I understood I too am against everything. And now he's using the term Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, must have come to me that very day, but not at all because of the forms. He's trying to say that he's not just copying the forms of the mask, which could be his way of defending his own inventiveness against the fact that obviously he's copying the forms, but it also might be his way of saying that it's much more than the forms. It's that the forms are carriers of power, which is how actually many African sculptural traditions have understood sculpture as a form of manifesting power. So he brings all of this into this painting also into the painting he makes of Gertrude Stein. And the scholars have talked about how this is happening in these, the painting of Gertrude Stein, a major poet, an experimental avant-garde poet of the time, who was also a wealthy art collector. It's happening in Stein's portrait and in the philosophical brothel, partly because it seems to be about Picasso's 
anxiety around women. Now, Gertrude Stein was a lesbian. She was powerful. She was brilliant. And he seems to have had trouble painting her face. He worked on this portrait for a very long time, taking a whole year, Pablo. And he's making everything's working fine, but her face eluded him until he was able to give it the abstracted, impersonal quality of a mask. Strong geometric nose, heavy lidded eyes, simplified face, as if he could deal with the power and the anxiety around power through the mediation of the mask. And that that's also what's happening with the philosophical brothel. Some art historians have actually done extensive research about Picasso having been a frequenter of brothels and having a terrible fear of acquiring syphilis, which was not yet curable and which was a devastating disease. So in this painting, by saying it's his first exorcism painting, he, he's saying that the forms, the figures, the masks, the colors are supposed to be working for him on his fear, pulling it out. And so this is the beginning of Picasso formulating this as his vision of what his art will do. I paint forms as I think them, not as I see them. His art is going to be conceptual, it's going to be oriented toward ideas, and it is really not going to follow at all the appearances of the world as they are in our usual experience of seeing. 